Hello everyone. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our ninth edition of our in loco webinars. Uh, my name is Teddy and I'm the project coordinator at Rise International. And I have my co-host with me today. Uh, that's Red Pilera Red, please say hi. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Retsepile Ramoko and I'm the design and media assistant at RISE. I'll be co-hosting the webinar today. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. Uh, now, for those of you who are only hearing about us for the first time, um, we are a social enterprise. We're located in the uh, in Lesotho, in the sub-Saharan uh, sub -Saharan Africa, uh, in a landlocked country um, by South Africa. Now, we recruit graduates in the built industry. Um, in construction, in architecture, in design, and we take them through a hands-on learning experience while contributing to change in community development. Now, today, today we have an amazing panel, um, you know, made up made up of uh, experts and also people who have contributed a lot in heritage and conservation. Now, today we'll be asked several questions such as, uh, what does heritage and conservation really mean? What does this really mean? And why does it really matter? You know, who's responsible for uh, conservation and heritage? And how will it build, uh, benefit the built environment sector? You know, how do we efficiently select those buildings to restore? Now, um, today I am joined by, um, I'm joined by Medino uh, Lerotodi. Uh, she works at the Ministry of Works. I'm joined by the Timlipi Mosese, and uh, he works at Lerotodi Polytechnic. I'm also joined by Mr. Bitadola Hadedi from Hadedi Domani and Montiani Architects. I'm also joined by um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Graham. Uh, he's a private practitioner, and uh, he shares a, uh, a heritage uh, uh, practitioner in the provisional government. And he also has a degree in conservation in the York University in England. We also have Janine. Uh, she's an arch international architect, and she also has masters at University of Cape Town. And last but not least, uh, we also have Mr. Stephen Gill. Um, I know most of you have known him from Marija Museum and Archives, and he's also joining us today. Uh, Dr. Stephen Gill is, uh, you know, a highly knowledgeable curator with professional research skills. And you know he has been uh, in the teaching experience for ten years at uh, Mapulani High School, and he also uh, was a volunteer at the Melonite uh, Central Community in Lesotho very early in the early ages, uh, from 1979 to, to 1985. And uh, he has also published a lot of books, um, as well as participated in the developing of Murija Arts and Cultural Festival and Murija Arts Center. And he will be taking us through a presentation today about the Seriti Samaharani to in order to kickstart today's webinar. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this Stephen. Thank, thank you, Nari Teddy. Thank you very much. Um, I, I know that we have people from outside of Southern Africa who are joining us, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to be clear so that even yourselves who are not familiar with Lesotho should understand what I'm saying. But if for some reason you don't catch certain things, um, this presentation which I'm making is going to be distributed later and so you can get fuller information therefrom. Um, the project which Morija Museum and the Royal Archives have been spearheading for the last four, five years is called Sariti Samahorani which perhaps we could translate as the prestige of Mahorani. Mahorani is important because Mahorani is a mountain, uh, a, a mesa, a flat top mountain south of Masero. And this is where the first um, Western missionaries were placed by Mushosha the Great in 1833. And it began a long process of, of enculturation uh, cultural ferment, um, and out of this process, you have icons such as Thomas Mofolo, the great writer, who I believe we can say is probably father of the African novel, and great composers such as J.P. Mohapelwa and many others. But in addition to, to this, in addition to being a center for learning, 
Mahwarani also happens to be the place where the royal house of Masutu has been um, resident for, for almost 200 years. Everyone knows that Mushushu the Great established the nation at Tababusiyu, but when he formed this partnership with the people he called teachers of peace, the missionaries, he placed his senior sons at Morija in order to better understand the, 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 the implications of these teachings and the new technology and so forth. So ever since Mushushu died, the center of of uh, local power, so to speak, in terms of the royalty, has been in the Mahorani Valley at Matsieng, Makining, and uh, Pameng. So we have a number of royal villages. And the purpose of Saritisa Mahorani is to better preserve the many layers of heritage and, and living traditions in the area. Um, unfortunately, in Lesotho, we don't have a strong history of valuing and investing in the conservation of, of various heritage sites. And so Sariti Samakhorani, which I'm going to call for short now SSM, has been trying at least in our area to pioneer a number of initiatives which would lead to not only the conservation of these sites, but the better presentation, because many people in the area feel that there's considerable value which can be leveraged in order to attract greater numbers of visitors and tourists, but also to attract other forms of investment into the area. And so SSM is keenly interested in a broad-based community approach, which will lead to benef beneficiation across a number of sectors. And we've been on this journey now since 2016. And we, My technical advisor is here. One of the things which is true about any, any large initiative or project of this nature is that at the core of it, there has to be a considerable amount of capacity building on a range of, of, of different areas. But in this case, in partnership with RISE, we've been able to begin to address the issue of capacity building with regard to conservation management. And for the last year, we've had five graduates of the Little Turi Polytechnic, one in architecture, one in civil engineering, and three in uh, construction management who have been living at one of the key villages being Makineng, the royal village of Lerotodi. And they've been working on learning the methodologies and the technical aspects of conservation heritage. And there are eight sites at Makineng and five at Moricha, which they're working on now. Um, we hope that by perhaps Easter next year, we will have technical drawings as well as uh, bills of quantity for all of those 13 sites done in such a way that it can be now presented to potential funding partners um, so that resources can come in to actually implement what has been a, a fairly long process of planning. Uh, we've been greatly helped through the partnership also with the Technical University of Milan, who both in a virtual sense, as well as physically have sent people here who has, have helped to, to guide the, the apprentices who have been working for the past year and to give them further capacity. Um, recently, as all of you know, Janine and Graham from Cape Town have also contributed tremendously and we hope that they can come out sometime in November for a week long seminar, which would further capacitate um, the local professional community with regard to built environment. Um, SSM and, and similar initiatives will not succeed unless we're able to build up a larger cadre of 
of professionals with the appropriate skills in Lesotho. And hopefully in future, when the National Heritage Council is appointed, architects, planners, and others from the built environment will be able to play a key role in the same way that Graham is playing for the province of the Western Cape in South Africa. When we have these heritage councils, it's not just for heritage professionals in the sense of historians, it's also for people in the built environment to become deeply involved and committed to processes to conserve the heritage in the country. And that it, Teddy, am I over time? No, 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 they're still over time. All right. Let me, you'll forgive me. I, my, my presentation is probably 40 minutes long and, and I only have a, a very limited amount of time. May I also say that, that initiatives such as Sariti Samaforani cannot succeed without a tremendous amount of interface with local government and particularly the local government council. Um, the Makwarani area has a local government council and the councils are empowered to carry out local area plans which look at issues of land use and potentially even issues of heritage conservation. And we are trying to start a process in our area where a local area plan will be developed for the area. But again, to be very honest, this is new for Lesotho. It is very rare that a local government council has an area plan. And as a result, if we don't get such area plans formulated through a, a strong community-based process, we're going to have a situation where decisions about land use and even about heritage monuments will be done um, in an, on an ad hoc basis to such an extent that uh, perhaps unwise decisions will be made and we will lose the value of, of some of these heritage resources. So SSM is trying in a more integrated fashion to ensure that these other processes also take off. And in 2019, we were given an opportunity to make a presentation to 11 of our government ministries at a high level concerning how this project could impact and would require the coordination and collaboration of, of government ministries and departments. That process needs to be revived again. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think I've probably taken my time and I'm very pleased to field questions but uh, RISE is going to distribute this document later. And we, we hope that anyone who has input will communicate with us. Our contact details are there on the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, if you have any questions, if there are any questions that you might have, please feel free uh, to leave them in the chat box. And also please feel free to leave them uh, on our page on Facebook. Uh, that's RISE, uh, Relationships Inspiring Social Enterprise on Facebook. So um, I'd like to hand over to my co-host, Reds, to continue with the, uh, with the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Teddy. Uh, thank you very much, Ndare Steve, for the presentation. Um, I would have loved for maybe, Teddy, you could put up the presentation again and just skim through uh, the pictures of uh, the Mahorani, just so the audience can see um, some of the artifacts of the heritage sites that he was talking about. Just came through, and uh, as I prepared to ask the first question, and uh, as everyone is asking in the chat box and also on Facebook, and so Janine. Allow me to ask you the first question uh, because you facilitated the seven week heritage and conservation online course that RISE hosted together with Graham. Would you please give us a, a, a brief definition and overview of what heritage and conservation is and what were your key takeaways from facilitating the workshop? Uh, thanks, Ritz. So I think in terms of, um, for me, it's, it's beyond a definition when we get to conservation, 
it's it's why is it important you know and and what does conservation do so for me it, it engages with the past in a conversation with the present so that we understand where we've come from to allow us to where we want to go so i think it's very difficult for a country for a nation to really do any planning without really having a full full understanding of where the country has come from and i think that's what's so amazing in terms of the built environment. Those images that you've just shown, that really tells us a story without anyone have to, having to kind of read anything. You see these buildings that are, that are just so um, infused with history of people's lives, you know, and what struggles they had and what joys they had. And that's what's the beautiful thing about heritage. It doesn't really distinguish um, whether it's, it's good or bad, all of these things are relevant and we have to be reminded of the good and the bad, but it's really there for a concrete reminder of what the country and the nation and the people have gone through to guide them in terms of where they want to go to. So it's really important that we preserve and restore and reconstruct and adapt these structures when it comes to conservation to ensure that these things are preserved and restored and reconstructed for future generations. So for me, conservation is very much about the future, although it uses elements of the past, you know? So if that kind of makes sense to you. So it's much more about what's happening in the future than what it is that's happened before, but we're using those as the building blocks. And then of course, it's, it's really important in terms of the English language, we all have different interpretations. So that's we're, uh, always really important that when you start out a conversation that you almost define what these words mean in the context that you're discussing it in. Because these words are obviously used loosely in the language for different meanings, but when we are dealing with conservation, we actually want to have a, a clear way of communicating what it is we wanting to do with a building or a, a site of, or, and so on. And, we've kind of just jotted down the key um, conservation actions that usually um, entail or uh, go around the built environment when we deal with them. So the one is preservation, which means that we kind of keep everything as much intact as possible, um, but kind of stop further deterioration. Then restoration means um, we don't look at adding new materials, but it's returning to the existing fabric and so on, but there's no introduction of new materials. Whereas reconstruction, there we start introducing new materials um, to consolidate fabric and so on. And then I think adaptation is almost one of the key um, conservation actions, especially in developing countries where one wants to retain that old building that has so much meaning, social, historic, cultural meaning but because there isn't kind of the money to make it a museum and make every second building a museum, we really need to look at how these buildings can remain economically viable without compromising the cultural significance, um, but then be retained and maintained and respected. So I think those are for me, the key kind of takeaways. And then, I mean, obviously that all connects to cultural significance. So I don't know if um, Graham maybe wants to weigh in on that's the next, like, that's actually the crux of the matter is the cultural significance. <laughs> You're on mute, Graham. <laughs> yeah, Graham, you can, you can go on and tell us a little okay, bit sorry, about yes, the right. cultural significance. Just, just, just before we go on to the cultural significance, I just want to reiterate some of the things that um, Janina said. And the one thing is that we all speak different languages often when we talk about conservation and we, we use different terminologies for the same thing. Um, for example, some people in South Africa, for example, we used restoration for a lot of the, a lot of the activities that, uh, for example, the Americans would call historic preservation. So that, that is why um, it's important for us to understand what these different terms mean and that all these actions that Janine's referring to are all fall under the umbrella of conservation. Conservation is the generic term under which all these different actions uh, apply. And the interesting thing is that you're never going to find, very rarely are you going to find one project in where one single one of these actions is going to apply. Very often it's a combination of these things. Um, 
a, a project could have aspects of preservation in it, could have uh, aspects of restoration or reconstruction. Um, probably very, very little preservation. You don't find much preservation happening outside museums, you know, um, because what you're doing is you're trying to keep something in its existing form for as long as it can. And you know, often in a, in a especially climatically controlled environment and all that sort of thing. So we're really talking there more about um, restoration and even more about reconstruction, because as Janine pointed out, when you're dealing with restoration, you're talking about using the fabric that there is there with. Maybe you are reassembling something that's fallen down, but you're using the same fabric. Um, so most of what we're actually dealing with is going to be one or other form of reconstruction or adaptation. Um, now just to go from there, but then, all right, so we're talking about these various different actions, but how do we know when and in what context we use them? And so we, we don't know, what, there's no way in which we can understand how to proceed with what would be an appropriate, let's call it conservation related action until we understand just how significant this entity is that we're working with. Now an entity can be all kinds of things. It can be a single building. It can be a group of buildings, but it could even be a townscape. It could be a, it could be a range of, of different, the extent can vary. Um, so- Yeah, it could be a valley all, as well, you know? Yeah, it could be, but yes, exactly. Um, so first of all, we've got to understand, identify what the devil it is we're actually talking about. And then the second thing we need to understand is just how significant is that in relation to the, the general, um, the general, let's call it the package of or basket of heritage resources that um, one has as a particular culture, as, as a nation. Um, so when we're looking at significance, um, it is important to, un to understand that one can put them into a certain hierarchy. Now in South Africa, we talk about national significance and then we talk about regional significance or local significance. In Lesotho, you, your legislation really only makes provision for national significance. It either is of national significance or it's nothing at all. And as we know, there is no such thing actually as nothing at all. There are so many other degrees of significance. And it's important to understand that because just because something is not, not of national significance, it might be of great local or regional significance, doesn't mean to say that it doesn't uh, require, doesn't, it shouldn't deserve funding, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be actions taken to, to conserve it in some or other way. So uh, the, the way in which um, one identifies the, sig the significance of that resource, the degree of significance of that resource, therefore becomes an important thing to understand. And as those of you on the course will know, we spent quite a bit of time on trying to understand how that could relate to Lesotho, for example. So yeah, yeah. can I just leave it with that for now? Yes, yes. Speaking of, you know, how they could relate to Lesotho, um, I just wanted to hear from uh, Dade Mulifi about uh, what he thinks we need to be aware in terms of restoring a heritage building like the ones that uh, that Steve showed um, um, in the presentation. And right after that, um, Teddy will take a couple of questions from the comment sections for the people, from the people who are watching the webinar. But yeah, over to you, Dr. Molifi. Um, if I may just um, explain a bit how I got involved in this um, to, to be here today. Um, I was involved in a workshop that was hosted by Rice. Um, Could you please speak up? Uh, I don't know if everyone is having a tough time hearing you, but yeah, wait, please speak up. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Am I clear? Could you speak? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Uh, uh, but it helps if you talk closer to the microphone. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I was explaining that. Um, uh, the way I got involved in this uh, session today is because I had attended uh, the workshop that was hosted by RISE on conservation uh, and preservation. Um, for getting to your question, that the, um, the, the, the main issue here is like uh, Krem has just um, explained that we need to understand certain 
um, definitions first, um, which are under conservation. Um, talking about preservation, restoration, reconstruction, and ad adoption. Uh, but particularly uh, when I talk about restoration, if I may just re remind people uh, what restoration means, um, it's about re um, uh, retaining uh, the existing fabric of a place to a known state by removing accres uh, accretions or by reassessing the existing component. It's here already. But um, I would base myself on three on three three points. Um, the first one would be we have to understand the significance of a fabric to determine the necessary intervention and how to prioritize that intervention. The particularly this is more or less based on the budget constraints. How 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 limited we are. To the budget um the next issue the next point or the, the next issue will be to understand what conservation of the fabric involves uh getting on this one it means we have to establish first on the four on the four on the four categories uh which one would be best appropriate for this so this is what would guide us whether we have to do the restoration we we'll do the preservation or reconstruction. The very last point when I get to that in that day it will be understanding the physical properties of the fabric. And um, if possible, how the fabric has been put together and constructed because we know um, things evolve through time from the first time the, the particular structure was constructed. And we need to understand how the technology was, the construction technology of that particular um, uh, 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 place or structure was, so that we can adapt to what was used, not to uh, not to rather destroy the, the the remaining, but rather to 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 keep it and maybe uh, just give it get it back to its original. Uh, state, if we can. Thank you, Dad. Thank you very much, Dad. Thank you very much, Dad. And Dr. Mulefi. Um, we also have, you know, a couple of questions from our audience uh, who are currently uh, in Zoom as well as on Facebook. There's a couple of questions that were directed to Dr. Steve. Um, so, Dr. Mpezulu. And then Pezulu wanted to find out from Dr. Steve whether um, if should sites associated with colonial rule and missionary activities be given a, a heritage status in what we call the Soto today? Um, I, I, I think this is a very interesting question. Um, I think um, Janine brought up the issue of, of significance and I, I, I think this is again where we need to say to ourselves, who establishes this significance? Um, or who, who interacts with the community and other stakeholders in order to determine significance? Um, and I, I think in, in Lesotho, the fact that we don't have a National Heritage Commission, it means that significance is there there's no mechanism whereby we can collectively decide which structures are significant based upon what principles and this is a shortcoming which needs to be overcome as soon as possible and can i um interrupt you there <laughs> um the lesotho national heritage um, resources act has got a definition in terms of their cultural significance. So there is already some structure in place that will help with the guiding of this. Um, so in terms of the Lesotho National Heritage Resources Act, they say, um, they speak about heritage significance is based on aesthetic, architectural, historical, scientific, social, cultural, and archeological values 
And then they also specifically re refer to sacred place, which links to the spiritual. So one would have to start um, researching and establishing whether a specific site has any of those values that's set out by the National um, Resources Act and to what a degree. Yes, exactly. And, and, and my, my point is simply this, and until we have an established National Heritage Council, there's no one who can really determine in any kind of authoritative way to manage it. Yeah. To manage the process, yes. Mm. And Fully. All, for example, I mean, obviously in Mahorani, we, we are making those efforts to understand not only what we as professionals might consider significant, but the, what the community considers as significant. And that's and so, very important. I, I don't think we can make a blanket statement about missionary heritage or colonial heritage. So much depends upon the community itself and the various stakeholders who are involved. But we need to have this formal process through a heritage council or a similar body in order to perhaps give it a greater sense of legitimacy. And then also, I mean, kind of um, heritage sites that have got negative connotations for the community, the current community, um, you know, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be um, conserved. So, I mean, obviously there are numerous ex examples in Germany, you know, with Nazi concentration camps and so on. And, and those are all really, really um, awful historical events that took place. But it's, it's also to a degree to remember that these things should not take place again. So it's not always celebrating the good. It's also as a reminder of what's happened in the past, which shouldn't be happening again. So I think that's also the important um, aspect of heritage. It's, it's not only positive um, associated spaces, you know. So it's, more, it's, more like a, uh, it's more like a story, as you said earlier, Janine. So, so, yeah, speaking on that, then I would, I would want to ask then what are the best strategies of, you know, restoration and uh, perhaps maybe preservation of historical heritage assets here in Lesotho? And maybe Andara uh, Buitatelo can take that one for us as, you know, he's been uh, working mostly in, in Lesotho in the architecture department. Uh, sorry, Ndare, you're yeah. muted if, if you're speaking. No, I'm yeah. fine now. Um, the question is, what are the best strategies to, to basically preserve the buildings? Um, yes, yes. Uh, as heritage uh, resources. Well, um, one of the ways that is important is what uh, has been done already by having um, a structure or you know, um, an act in place. Um, yes, that act will have to be developed, but having that is a very important thing because um, that act uh, serves as a guide so that um, anybody who wants to preserve buildings will know where to start and what not to do and what to do. So then that means also even the, 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 this kind of information has to be filtered through through schools, through communities to understand that, you know, the, 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 the heritage resources are important. Uh, and I think um, the point has been very well made by Janine earlier on that uh, linking uh, the, the past with present helps us to, to know how to act in the future. So yes. um, the strategy is basically just, uh, just going back to your question having the, the, you know, the, the act in place and getting people to know it. You know, in other words, even in our communities, in our institutions of um, you know, um, uh, teaching, st students have to be made to understand that because of modern and contemporary uh, um, way of doing things, all things do not have to be demolished. They have to be respected. Uh, maybe I can put it that way in brief. Okay, okay. Um, um, I want to, you know, delve a bit into the having an act in place. When you talk about having an act in place, that means there are people uh, who are kind of responsible for managing the sites and also um, 
classifying them. So maybe I would want to know in Lesotho, in the context of Lesotho, who is responsible for such an act and who is responsible for managing such uh, heritage sites. Perhaps maybe Nola Rotori could ask, answer this one. Hello, uh, everyone, <laughs> there you go. and thank you very much for being given the platform. I'm Dinello Gotudes. It has been explained. I'm a principal architect for the Ministry of Public Works, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Royal Archives, which happens to be located within the Mahwaran area. Um, Allow me to start by saying the side in question or the subject of discussion today, which is Mahwarane area, uh, comprises of four villages, as you saw the map that was presented by Nare Stephen Jill. And there are communities uh, residing in those villages. What makes Mahwarane special is the fact that um, is the hub of our very rich heritage located within these four villages. It's there, uh, but it has never been connected in any way such that communities that live in this area could even reach treasure within which they reside or live. And answering your question, who should, uh, I would say all of us then, okay. but I would say the communities of these areas on the practical sense of things. But uh, administratively, uh, the Ministry of Tourism, uh, Culture and Environment is currently the custodian of issues surrounding our heritage and culture. And um, even the monuments and anything to do with our heritage currently, we would say the, the, the Ministry of Tourism is the custodian. But in my opinion, the custodian number one is the communities which live around such uh, destinations or such places or such um, items. And um, before, 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 before we talk legislation, before we talk all this uh, formal and official things, the key people are the people that live around these places. If they are aware, if they are educated, if they are helped, to have a sense of ownership of these things. They are the number one custodians. They are people or key owners who should say what should happen even before government ministries and officials comes in place. We built legislation driven by what they want as communities and what is important to them and what is of value to them Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, uh, moving on, then I would want to um, ask about um, the the effect that preserving these heritage sites has on the communities. As you mentioned, that you know, yes, the tourism, the Ministry of Tourism is a custodian, but even us as 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 but so to people as the nation, we are also custodians. So I'd like uh, maybe Stephen and Graham to talk about what effect um, does the cultural and heritage preservation have of on the communities surrounding such areas? Well, uh, shall I go first? Uh, okay. Um, I, I think it, it, it's going to vary, obviously, depending on what communities you're talking about. I, and I think it's the ones that uh, it's the communities just getting back to uh, who who manages this, who are the custodians, and um, and it's quite correct as Nino says that it's actually the community, the communities. But someone has got to start this. 
And you'll find in various countries, these things generally start by a community group or an interest group of some kind, getting together and identifying what they think is significant within that area. So that's the first step, is to first identify what is significant, um, as we mentioned earlier. But then um, um, uh, once, once people have uh, got an idea of what they regard as important, um, there can be enormous potential on how, uh, how the practice of conservation in those areas can actually help to empower those communities. I think we long past the stage, as I think Janine mentioned earlier, we, we not, we, no one can afford to have, uh, let's say, for example, a building used as a museum, and it just becomes, although there will be some individual sites that are important to be com commemorated and kept as museums, but we can't afford that uh, for everything. So everything generally does need to have some kind of practical use. That's the first thing. But before that, there's the process of how one goes about um, those activities we put under the, uh, the umbrella term of conservation. There's an enormous amount of potential for building projects or let's call them uh, reconstruction projects to actually be used as training bases for people to develop niche skills in those particular ways of working with those with those buildings, they can then use those skills to market them, if you like, in other parts of the country doing similar kind of work. Because one of the things that uh, I think once is also picked up in the in in the um, in that uh, the course that that we were doing is that there are there are specific ways in which you need to deal with with these various sites, and um, by by engaging, uh, by engaging the actual communities, using the people within those communities, training them up in the course of not only a reconstruction, but in maintaining those, you are giving them, you're making them stakeholders in those particular areas. There's an enormous potential for that. It's not something that has actually been realized nearly as much as it should be, and that includes in South Africa. Um, I'm speaking in very general terms, but um, there are, there are a number of specific projects that could be in the suit, I could imagine, that could be identified and that could actually pick up on this and use these as vehicles for community empowerment. Stephen, I'm sorry, I've not taken too much time there. Uh, I just tried to do briefly. Uh, Steve, I need you on please mute. unmute yourself. <laughs> unmute yourself there. <laughs> yeah. Graham, I, I, I was saying those are excellent comments and, and much I, I, I applaud them. I, I would just like to add there's also another dimension which we often fail to realize. You, you know, so often a project is something with a timeline. And I, I don't want to say it's that, uh, that a project like ours can be seen in terms of an engineering project, but many times it's actually rolled out according to deadlines and so forth. And, and what we fail to, to remember is that, as you say, it's the community which ultimately has a broader sense of ownership. And if we neglect that, we end up with this terrible disconnect. One of the things which the initial steering committee to SSM recommended was that teachers should be intimately involved in these processes so that it could also then enter into the schools, such that if the children grew up with a stronger sense of the heritage in their area, it would not only shape their sense of identity, but it would also give them pride. And I think we, we, we often neglect this simply because of, of technical and financial deadlines and, and it's to our detriment. Um, we, we have to get the communities more deeply involved. It's a slow process, but it has to be attended to. Otherwise, we're not going to achieve the optimal results in the end. Maybe I can just add, yeah. add to that. Um, uh, uh, also, um, uh, because I think the, 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 the issue of schools is a very important one. I come back to the point that it's going to take a group to, to initiate this. Um, and the way to initiate this is to actually 
start an inventory, literally develop an inventory of what one regards as the significant sites and elements in a particular area. Um, you're not going to, and, and that, let's call them a steering group, would then actually present that to, to the community, get the community involved, get the community discussing that, so that by the time uh, that inventory is developed, and by the way, inventory is never a static thing, it continues to evolve, but you then get the people themselves to be part of, under, of, of identifying what is significant for them. Just thought I must mention this because we keep saying the first step is to identify what is significant, but the way to identify it is for a, invariably, it's a particular group that needs to take the initiative to start it. In South Africa, it was architects back in the 1920s, 1930s that generally did uh, because of the interest in buildings. And that's why in South Africa for a long time, there was a strong emphasis on buildings. But, you know, you've got historians, you've got landscape people, you've got people who are involved in the natural environment. All of those are, are important aspects of what ultimately makes a, a particular heritage resource important, whether it is a landscape or whether it is individual buildings. So someone needs to take the initiative and get this invent inventory going. And probably the best way to do it is to start by focusing on buildings and their context, because most people can understand that. They, 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 they've got something tangible in front of them. And, 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 um, and then broad, you, one can broaden that out from looking at individual buildings ultimately to developing the inventory later to include other things like the landscape context and so on. I think yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one of the issues is uh, um, that um, the seminar is asking a question or the webinar is asking a question where, you know, where to start. And I think mm, yes, exactly. um, the yes. points that have just been raised are, are very helpful in that uh, we don't have to wait for the ministry to start mm. because I, it probably is the case that the ministry um, is not much uh, aware, let me, mm. let me put it in a, in a sort of reckless way, mm. aware of the act itself and their responsibility towards it because they've got so many things, you know, especially this ministry because it's got tourism, culture, mm. this and that and everything else. So. Uh, there has to be a certain group of people, uh, be they small in number or what, mm. that can actually spearhead the whole process. And like like uh, Graham said, uh, you, know, you know, in the in the example of South Africa, the architects started on the buildings, but we are aware that um, heritage and, and um, conservation is not only about buildings; it's actually mm. a very wide uh, uh, field, but somebody has or some group has to start somewhere and then this can just grow and become significant um, in, in, in the broader sense that it should. So there has to be a group and maybe um, as, as, as one could maybe take advantage of this that some of those people that probably went through the, the, the workshop could actually be that group that can start somewhere uh, and then even if they do not have a uh, an official mandate, but that uh, can mm. actually be taken to to initiate a discussion with uh, the powers that be and the local communities, uh, who may actually be very very happy to find that they are sitting on a treasure that they didn't realize is a treasure. Thank you. Yeah, I like I like what uh, Medinel said that it gives a sense of of pride to surrounding community communities, and it also rekindles identity which which goes back to what you said about you have to know your past uh, in order for for it to give you direction towards towards the future and as you're saying that lady that perhaps maybe the people who were in the in the in the course could could kind of be the steering ones i would like to further ask how do you in your observation maybe is there young tourists visiting these cultural and heritage sites? And if, if they are, or if they're not, how do we encourage them to visit them and to understand the importance of who they are and where they're from and, and you know, to give themselves that kind of direction and also to take ownership on, on some of these cultural significant uh, stories that we're talking about? Well, um, maybe the 
person who can better uh, uh, answer that question is Nader Steve because he has a lot of visitors that actually come to the museum and stuff like that. But my uh, perception is that there are not many people, especially young people, that are interested in um, heritage um, and, and, and conservation issues. Uh, and understandably, they will not just love that without them being orientated and be taught about that, uh, which is why I think it was Graham who said, this has to be you know, worked on, 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 on students and pupils you know, from the young age so that they can actually begin to appreciate that um, even before they could, they could go, you know, grow older. So yes, um, there, there has to be a lot of work in terms of um, making people aware, which is basically what history does making people aware of why it is important to, to know your past and understand your history and even the, the heritage resources as they're called, understanding why it is important. Like the, one of the questions that said, well, what about, you know, the colonial uh, bad effects? Why, do, why should we preserve that? Yes, the very reason uh, why we should preserve it is because maybe we had bad historical uh, interaction with it. Uh, so that it, as they say, um, uh, you know, sometime, um, lest we forget. So if, if, we, if we love something and keep only those things that we love, we'll never know what, uh, what, what to learn from those that we don't like. So in, in the end, we'll, we'll keep making the same mistake about those that we don't like because we didn't actually learn anything from them. So I'm basically just going to your question. Um, yeah, there has to be a lot of um, promotion of heritage teaching and orientation from the young age. And like I said earlier, even at this, uh, the institutions of uh, architecture, I don't know if you, that I think has to come in as one of the, the, um, the subjects to, for people to understand conservation and, 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 and preservation and all, all that. Um, thank you, thank you Hatley, on that. Um, actually, my my take on this also, um, if you hear me... Sorry, Nadir you, 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 I'm sorry, uh, um, Nadir Mlifi, you can't hear you very well. I don't know whether it's a volume or something. We lost a lot of uh, what you said even earlier, so I don't want to... Yes, 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 yes. Ah, am that's I, better. Am, am I clear now? Yeah, it's, it's a bit better now. Okay. I was just adding up. I was just adding on one that the lady has just um, outlined. Um, actually, I think the the other thing that we need to do is to do community outreach because we have this uh, heritage resources in certain communities, but some somehow some people still don't understand what those uh, resources are. So I think if we do from council, from community councils and get into educating the communities more, that will help us more because it will also, it will be an umbrella sort of education where from a parent to a child, and that will be something that will be going on from, for generations to come. Also, he mentioned something about um, institutions of higher learning. Um, relevance that's another thing because the history of architecture we are doing in schools actually has nothing to do with us here it's true we have to understand how architecture may be developed but i think now it's a high time that we get into relevant um type of um, information uh, because we have we, we we have these things now um in our own communities and places uh, the other issue, the last issue that I'll be talking about is uh, information dissemination. Uh, we have limited uh, places where we have this information, where people can go and access this type of information. They are very minimal. Uh, currently, we have Morija, um, and only a few people, if I, I have realized, get to visit this place. But around Maseru, which is uh, where most of the people are located, um, I'm not aware of a place where we can say there is information that can assist us in understanding this thing. Thank you.
Can I can I add something? Yes, you may. Yes. Um, just to say that um, it goes back to where one starts, and I think start with with where you where you have um, start with your assets, the things that are really clear, and they don't necessarily have to be buildings. Uh, for example, uh, Marisha just mentioned again. From my limited understanding and knowledge of Lesotho, it seems to me to be quite a strong cultural center. There are people there, it's a center of literature, it's a center of art, it's a center of a whole range of things. The people, the activities going on there, it's all interlinked. It's, it's you know, buildings are, not, are, are only, only relevant uh, uh, when, uh, if they're associated, or if, they, if they're part of a living culture, if they're part of a living landscape, put it that way. So identify in Lesotho where these concentrated points are and start there. You can always expand from that later. So um, Mauritius seems to me one obvious place to start um, outside the uh, Masiru. I, I, I don't know there, but maybe there's there's another place there. But start where, you, where you've got a, already an established knowledge base where it's easier to get people to, to um, well, it, it's easier to be able to do basic research doing the inventories that I was telling you about. And at the same time, maybe doing one or two demonstration projects with using locals so people can actually begin to understand that this is, there's, a, there's a real training potential here as well. This is a way in which people's lives can be improved. So it's, you're not just talking about static exhibits. I think that's the important point I want to make. I like, I like that point that you made that, you know, it, which speaks back to the, uh, title of our of our webinar where do we start and that's where you said you know identifying with the living landscape so that it you know it doesn't start from aesthetic point of view um so i think you know in this one hour we managed to unpack a little bit <laughs> in terms of uh heritage and, and conservation uh so with that being said i'm gonna hand over to teddy and to conclude this wonderful, wonderful webinar, which is had. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you for your inputs and your participation. Over to you, Teddy. Thank you very much, Red. I highly appreciate that. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, for being here today. This was very insightful. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, our panelists who shared very insightful presentations at the beginning uh, on conservation and heritage. And I'd also like to thank um, you know, I'd like to thank the David Hattolo Khatiri, who is a practicing architect and registered with the uh, SACA Professions um, and South African Institute of Architects. And I'd also like to thank Med Neol Rotori, the principal architect at the Ministry of Works, as well as the Timuli Pimosese, uh, who's a lecturer at Laboratory Polytechnic, where uh, you know, plethora of the graduates that are recruited at RISE come from. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Stephen Gill, uh, who did a very informative uh, presentation on Sariti Sadmahwagani, and also Janine Dival, who did a wonderful presentation, as well as uh, Mr. Graham Jacobs, uh, who is a private international practitioner um, in conservation and heritage. Well, please feel free to fill in the seminar. Uh, looks like Thanks, people who are still uh, joining us right now. <laughs> anyway, if you only <laughs> just right now, please, uh, to catch the uh, the recording of this webinar on Facebook, we'll leave it right there on Facebook uh, for you to watch, and you we'll also share this uh, this uh, recording with everyone who signed up. I'd like to thank everyone uh, who joined. So please feel free to uh, uh, you know quickly fill in that uh, that quick survey, and you can also catch this um this recording on facebook as well so join us again on the 28th of october that will be uh the last thursday uh every month we that is the time that we host this webinars and um thank you very much to my co-host reds it was a pleasure thank, thank you, you very you. much one thank you to our panelists as well thank you, thank thank you. Thank you very much thank you uh, very yes. much you thank you <laughs> all right all right see you next time bye bye Bye, bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.